Welcome to Under the Skin with me, Russell Brand. Today's show is sponsored by my new book, Recovery, which is available today. Order it by going to russellbrand.com. It's a good book. It's out now. Go get it. Now it's time for Under the Skin. You're listening to Under the Skin with me, Russell Brand, and I'm talking to Professor David. I'm assuming Professor. Yeah, you can. You can drop the Professor. I don't like it very much. Oh, Professor, eh? I've come up in the world. Professor David Harvey. I'll be talking to as if we was equals. Uh, David Harvey, Professor David Harvey, is the world's leading Marxist thinker. Oh, no. That's what it says. So I'm I'm just reading the script, mate. I'm just reading the script. He writes extensively on Marxist geography, social justice and the political economy and is the author of over 20 books, including 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism, Rebel Cities and The New Imperialism. He is a distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at the Graduate Centre of the City University of New York and has been teaching Marx's capital for almost 40 years. His new book is titled Marx, Capital and the Madness of Economic Reason. Professor David Harvey, thank you very much for being our guest on Under the Skin. Thank you. You're here somewhat to promote this book, Marx, Capital and the Madness of Economic Reason. Why are you? Why have you written this book now? Well, I'm, I've been involved over several years now in what I call the Marx Project, which is uh, to try to uh, explain to people what it was that Marx was talking about and to do it in terms which are... Simple without being simplistic. It's been quite a challenge to do that because Marx is kind of a bit of a hard read when you first read him. But a lot of academics spend a lot of their time trying to make Marx more complicated than he already is. So I'm trying to make it simpler so that people can grasp it. And I've had a series of books which have come out, and this is the the, the last one, and it may not be the final one, but it. It, it, I try to put a lot of things together in this book about what the, what's going on in the three volumes of Capital, how they relate to how the three volumes relate to each other, and and how coming out of that you get a picture of capitalist society and the essence of what capital is about. What does Marx mean when he says that uh, society's starting point is the what do you say accumulation of commodities? Well, he, he you know it's it's wealth uh, appears, and, and when Marx uses the word appears, you always got to. Take Take it as appears, and it doesn't mean it is. You know, it, it appears as if it's an immense accumulation of you know commodities like yachts and McMansions and and all the rest of it. That's how the wealth appears to people. I see. So you know, he uses appears very deliberately because he's saying that it's a, a, a yeah, visual or apparent as opposed to yeah, essential. He, yeah, he's always trying to get behind the the realm of appearance to try to find out what the reality of it is underneath, and then that's very much what capital is about as a book. Oh, really? So I suppose that must be uh, built, uh, the platform for that must be that capitalism appears to be like something, but it is not that. No, it's, uh, uh, it, it appears to offer possibilities of freedom and emancipation, but actually what it does is to imprison people uh, in certain ways of life and certain ways of being. Uh, so you're promi- made promises of, for instance, access to the American dream, uh, something like that, and uh, then you sort of told, well, you should borrow hundred thousand dollars to buy a house, and then you're pinned in to pay off that hundred thousand dollars for the next, uh, you know, when thirty years. When was that capital written? And it was written in stages, you know, during the 1850s, 1860s, and of course we're in the 150th anniversary right now of the publication of Volume 1 of Capital. Volume 2 and 3 were never published. What was happening with capitalism and industrialization for Marx to write Das Capital then? And I suppose I'm asking, was the book prophetic? Uh, well, it was one of, one of the things that was, was really stunning of that period was the encounter people had with the emergence of the factory system. 
I mean, people were familiar with uh, you know, artisanal forms of labor and workshops and things like that. But when they went from the continent, and Engels has a great description of this, like he went from Germany where he's used to these sort of artisanal systems and he gets to Manchester and he says, this is incomprehensible, this huge factory with all these people there and this is incredible. So in some ways, Marx is the first great theorist of industrial capitalism. First person really to grapple with what it was about. And Engels helped him on that. I see. Artisanal means like people just doing little craft things yeah, in small yeah, groups. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the crafts people were in charge of their own means of production. You know, they had their own skills and things like that, and they had a certain kind of power because of those skills. But they get de-skilled and pushed into a factory where they become essentially dominated by, by this capitalist industrial system. Yes, and th th that obviously has a profound impact on an individual and a, yeah. as well as but then but then yeah but then Marx kind of is not only talking about what what has happened he's talking about what the future of the system is going to look like and he sees that capitalism by definition is going to be about technological change because one of the things that's crucial to the capitalist is increasing the productivity of labor so you want more machines more you know bigger all forms of organization uh, also since uh, capitalism is about profit making the system has to expand so it has to grow and it has to be Revolutionary in relationships, in relationship to its uh, technological and organisational form, and so Marx is trying to talk about the fu our future, as well as oh, our past. That's brilliant. So what I've already understood in a few minutes of conversation there is because capitalism has essentially built into it its own destruction and our own destruction because it's built on expansion and profit and, and as you said, must have as its creed continual technological advancement and efficiency. It's ultimately destructive. So its essence must always be concealed. So it must always appear to be something that it's not because yeah. otherwise people will go, hold on a minute, this is going to ruin us. No, I basically, I mean, look, uh, I've been around a long time and I remember in the 1960s, uh, there were all these people who were saying, we've got to deal with global poverty. How do we deal with it? Capitalist development's the answer. Well, it didn't work. It made things worse. Mm. So I heard the same story in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, and we hear it today. Mm. We've got all this poverty around, and the, the way to do it is to unleash the market and get capital to do it. And actually what capital does is it produces inequality. Even though the, the time that Das Capital was written, it would have been relatively early in capitalism's journey yeah because it's just immediately post industrialization so that's a particular type of capitalism isn't it that's facilitated by industrialization or it, well, what was capitalism prior to industrialization well well two things to say about that i mean when marx was writing capital as a, as a as an economic system dominated only one in very small corner of the world i mean it was basically britain some parts of western europe and maybe eastern the united states and that was it that was that was if you like the geographical terrain within which the capital accumulation process was operating now it's global it's happening in china it's happening in africa it's uh, it's happening in india and indonesia so we're no longer sort of talking about uh, something that's c occurring in a little corner of the world we're talking about something that has grown to the point where it's now become completely global so that would be the first point to make. The second thing is that in terms of its temporality, one of the things that happens is in competition, speed up becomes very important. If I can turn over my capital faster than you, I get the profit and you don't. So there's an incredible you know, incentive under capitalism to move things faster. So we get this speed up going on and uh, the speed up of technological change and the speed up of, of the turnover time of capital and the obsolescence time. I mean, how many new kinds of t phones have you had in the last 10 or 15 years? I mean, this is a classic. Capital moves into those areas where it can actually turn over times as fast as it can. Really? And this creates a great deal of stress in people's lives. Yes. They're actually keeping up with the speed of, of everything. It's kind of crazy. It's too much and it's unnatural and it has no marker but its own it's not it's not indigenous it's not a natural marker that no. that marks out its time its minutes its seconds no. but one that's only right. to pres 
to inspire cons- consumers. Yeah, Capital came out with a definition of a civilized society, which is kind of one where workers do what they're supposed to do. And it always talked about, you know, pre capitalist societies as being uncivilized. And there's some studies of those societies and say the working day for many of those societies was something like four hours. Brilliant. Wouldn't I you like to, wouldn't, I love wouldn't, that. Wouldn't you like hours. to live four hours a day and then really the rest of the day you did what the hell you like? Freedom, actually, freedom, free time is one of, the, one of the great emancipatory possibilities that exists within capitalism. We have all of these equipment, which is about, you know, making things go faster. But are people having more free time? The answer is most people feel more pressed on their yes. time now than ever before. Stress is a necessary component. I can see how, like, the inducing a state of fear is a requirement for that system yeah. to function and to continually speed, yeah. and how it utilises biology and, uh, and psychology to perpetuate a sort of this sort of, it's a kind of yeah. terrorism of the mind. Yeah, and it connects also to, you know, Marx talks a lot about the, the problems of uh, realisation and that uh, capitalists need to sell their product. And in order to sell their product, there has to be a want, need and desire mm. for commodities. So actually the history of capitalism has been about the creation of wants, needs and desires to the point where we've got now where it's kind of, you know, we, we have kind of crazy pressures on us to, yeah. to sort of change our culture, change our thinking, change our wants, needs and desires. Change our phones. I mean, the example that you've already used yeah, of obsolescence right. is that, like, you know, when right. uh, is that uh, I, 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 I've tried to buy less phones, but however many phones I've bought, it's more phones than I I needed. Yes, I absolutely. only needed one. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I, well, one of the things I kind of say in, in some of my lectures, I said, you know, I'm still using my grandmother's knives and forks. If capital produced things that lasted 100, 150 years, it would have gone out of business a long time ago. Yeah. So it needs to produce things that don't last. And, and therefore, it needs to produce new fields of wants, needs, and desires. And, you know. So this is something that's a tremendous kind of pressure which connects to what capitalist growth is about. It's antithetical to our humanity. It's a, a, a destructive idea. It's funny, isn't it, when you hear like, sort of like a brilliant, one could say, intellectual such as Sam Harris talking about the uh, sort of the cruelty and malevolence of, uh, of an ideology such as, you know, Islam, because it can be used to resource in, this is their argument, uh, extremism and terrorism, and yet the most obvious, dominant, all-encompassing ideology that creates such malevolence, so antithetical to our spirit yeah, and our yeah. way of being, passes uh, other than outside academia. Uh, certainly it's uh, uh, seldom described as being an attack on our sort of essential humanity. But I think that uh, that's how we have to describe it. And that's one of the brilliant things that comes out of reading Capital is you see, you know, what appears to be a liberatory force turns out to be a force of domination, which has in it this all of these repressive uh, aspects to, the, to daily life. And that's that's to me is one of the big lessons that comes from reading a text like Capital. Given your stated objective of uh, uh, making capital more accessible, perhaps we'll start this conversation with uh, perhaps illuminating a few simple terms and ideas. So I'll go through these questions. Firstly, why are you not calling it Das Kapital like how you're supposed to? Um, well, you know, I'm using the English translation, so I use the English Very language simple. to talk about it. Not talking there, is, there, there are some I problems about the translation, and uh, obviously, but uh, that's what I'm working from. Because I suppose because of that brief yeah. to simplify. Right. Firstly, why is this book so important? I mean, capital, although your book I think is important as well. I'm not trying to belittle your book. So why is Capital and why is it an important book? What's in there that's relevant to people today in, in 2017 after we have endured the idea, the negative stories about communism? Like why is this book? Why is Capital an important well, thing for us to understand well, now? First off, a, you know, Capital as a book is not about communism. Oh, it's uh, it's about it's a critique of capitalism. And it's not even a critique of capitalism in every respect. It's a, it's a critique of how what I would call the engine of capitalist development uh, works, uh, how the laws of accumulation of capital work, because 
capital is an expansionary system. It's constantly expanding. And how does it expand? And what kind of stresses does that do that does that create amongst working people? What kind of stresses in relationship to cultural evolution? What kind of stresses in relationship to environmental questions and and, and the like? And we're surrounded, obviously, with all of those questions about the environment, about cultural preservation, about uh, even the definition of what what it is it means to be a human being. We're having a big debate about that in the United States right now because everybody looks at Trump and says, is that the future of what humanity is going to look like? And the answer of many people is, no, we've got to think of something really different. So, so with all of those questions around, uh, you need to know what it is that is driving capitalism uh, to do the kinds of things it does in relationship to exploitation of the environment, social inequality, cultural transformations, the production of new wants, needs and desires, mm. all of those sorts of things. We need to have a theory of that. And Marx is the first person really to come to terms with what that theory might look like. In the 1850s, Marx was able to identify in this critique of capitalism what likely trends and what the result of capitalism would be, even though this is like, you know, 150 years ago, and that's one of the reasons you've written the book, isn't it? Even though 150 years ago, it, it was able to predict what was it about capitalism then that made it evident that this economic system would fail? Uh, well, first, first, first that it has to grow. Right. It has to grow at uh, what we call a compound rate, which is kind of, a, you know, 3% per year is a small amount of, uh, new commodities and so on back in 1850, but by the time you get to 2000, it's a huge amount of new commodities. Mm. So, so it's got to grow, and at some point or other, it's going to hit limits to that right. growth. So, in the end, that's quite a simple observation yeah. that Marx made then, because if you change the word capitalism to the word elephant, then it, like they, he's like going, hold on a minute, if this elephant has to continue to grow, it's going yes. to fill the room and kill us all. Yes. Like you just right. pointed out that. Right. Yeah. No, it's uh, it, it's a growth machine. And it has to grow because that's the only way in which it can assure profitability. Profit is an excess. Yes. And you have to produce the excess in order for capital to survive. And then you have to use that excess to produce more excess. So it's, it's it, you know, endless accumulation is it's one of the rules of the game. It's necessarily and essentially impractical. It's yes. not about fulfilling right. a practical right. need. It's right. about creating needs that are not there yeah. in order that it might right. continue to right. have compound growth. So how come that that observation was made in 1850? How come everyone didn't go, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Right, stop this capitalism then. Well, because there was plenty of room to expand back in 1850. Right. I mean, the rest of the world was there. And, of course, we had colonialism, we had imperialism, we had all of the expansions around the world. So there's plenty of room for that growth to occur. Uh, it was a, what I call, uh, you know, capital is getting into what I call a spatial fix a lot of the time, which is what, what capital do is get a super amount of commodities uh, and, and, and capacity in Britain. So it wouldn't know what to do with it. So uh, the British would lend to Argentina to build railroads and the railroads would be produced in Britain. So, you know, so... Argentina gets caught into the kind of the circulation of capital. So so there were plenty of places like that for capital to grow into. But yeah. now there's no place left. I mean, maybe Africa still is not completely gone, but pretty much everywhere in the world has been caught into it right now. So growth from here on out is not feasible when it was feasible back in 1850. Right. So even if someone had said, hold on a minute, if we have to, in if we have to indefinitely grow this ideology, it will necessarily bring about our destruction. And the uh, response to that was... That'll be ages. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. no one was bothered. Yeah. Well, you know, back then, uh, you know, the United States was only just beginning. Mm. And, and you had the whole United States continent to sort of, and the North American continent to, to occupy. Would I be right then in asking, David, and beyond right and more importantly than right, bloody clever in asking, that, uh, that capitalism uh, is sourced from imperialism and colonialism. It's an economic model that fits the preceding ideology, which had been a, a rather more obviously inethical uh, system of domination. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, capital has always been about uh, geographical expansion. Now, whether you call it colonialism or you call it imperialism, I actually prefer to call it uneven geographical development because yeah, sometimes imperialism makes it is too too simple a term. Oh. 
because because right now, if you look at the way in which commodities are made, you know, one piece is made in Taiwan, one piece is made in South Korea, another piece is made in Mexico, and then it's all put together in the United States, and you say, where is capital in all of this? So right now, it's a much more complicated kind of story. So I kind of saying, well, where where is where is all this work going on, uh, which is producing the commodities that get on our table? And one of the th questions I always like to start my geography classes off with was questions of where does your breakfast come from? from. And it was kind of really interesting. People kind of go, oh, I never thought about it. And they, they kind of say, well, it comes from the supermarket. And you say, no, 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 I want to feel where, the, where all the stuff come from. And, and after about three weeks of asking the same question, people would say things like, I didn't have breakfast this morning. <laughs> I've no, stopped having it. No, I've stopped having breakfast. Ask this question. No, 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 I don't like this question I'm about not hungry. my breakfast. No, I'm not hungry <laughs> I anymore. drank some water out of a puddle <laughs> yes. on the way here. Ah, but that rain, where <laughs> yes. did that cloud, a cloud accumulate? Yeah. And why was that cloud there? I'm not coming to your classes anymore. It's too hard. Yes. No, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got a lot of dropouts from my geography class because I kept asking that question. <laughs> but, the, but in a way, uh, capitalism is a vehicle for a particular type of mentality, which yeah. is kind of about what? Well, it's, um, you know, the, the famous kind of statement, the greed is good. Uh -huh. uh, there's that kind of uh, side to it. But, but actually the mentality now has shifted a bit because I think a lot of capitalism is a, is about a complicated relationship with the debtors. And I, one of the things that I'm talking about in this last book a lot is the way in which the future has got foreclosed by debt. That debt is a claim on future labor, and it's a claim on your future labor. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're heavily in debt, you've got to pay it off. Yes. So the incentive you have right now is not to kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's getting rid of the debt. It's a drag, got. isn't it? I'm supposed to be rich and I'm enslaved. Yeah. Well, this is exactly, this is exactly right. That, that, that it's about foreclosure and it's about, it's about n not emancipating you at all. It's about imprisoning you in a network of uh, debt relations, which have become very different. That's why, you know, student debt, I mean, states now, we've got this horrible amount of student debt, which really forecloses the future for people for, in, in remarkable ways. If you can remove morality from uh, the lens of analysis, in, it's sort of ingenious in its mendacity oh. in the number of ways in which it's dominating. Yeah, and by the way, uh, Marx does not make a moral argument. I oh. mean, no, it's not a really essentially a moral argument. It's, it's, it's about uh, the inevitability of mendacity. <laughs> Oh bloody hell! Cool. Hey, so like, what? Bearing in mind, like, that this is still the simple bit of the podcast, uh, you know, for, for for me and one imagines you. But the, what is the difference between socialism, Marxism, and communism? Is there a quick way of doing that? Well, socialism, I think, is generally spoken of as uh, a transitional. A system in which uh, capitalism is put under sufficient constraints so that you have social democracy and it's you know and I think traditionally it was seen as a stepping stone to full communism where which would lead to the abolition of the class relation between capital and labor and uh, the abolition of class privilege and eventually of course the abolition of the capitalist state apparatus so communism is seen as something a further stage going beyond uh, whereas under socialism elements of the uh, capitalism would still exist, the market system would still be there, money of the sort that we use and uh, accumulate would still be there, but under, social, under communism a lot of that would then uh, disappear. Marxism, uh, for me anyway, is, is a mode of analysis that is a way of thinking, which is a critical way of thinking. And and it it says to you when you when you got some sort of situation, and you want to try to understand what the hell is happening, you don't get deceived by surface appearances. You don't get deceived by ideological kind of bluster. You get you you, you do an analysis and for yourself, and you come up with an understanding of what's really going on here. And when you understand what's really going on here, you can then act uh, against what is really happening in a, in a deep way, rather than simply deal with surface symptoms. I see subcutaneous analysis, not just it's, it, the yeah, observation yeah, of yeah. symptoms, because right. when you observe the symptoms, you're necessarily confined by right. the argument right. of the other. Yeah, one of the things Marx said was, if 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 uh, you know, if everything was as it seemed to be on the surface, there would be no need for science. <laughs> so we look at we look at the sun, and it looks like the sun's going around the Earth, but we find out, well, it isn't. You know, that it's, it's the Earth rotating. So that's another this podcast. Is, this Christ, is, this write, is, write that down. <laughs> this is I, so that's what that's what Marx means by appearance. 
uh, yes. and, and and the reality behind it. So it's uh, and and you know most scientists I think would recognise there's a difference between symptoms and you know what the underlying cause is, and most medical practitioners would would recognise that difference. And Marx is trying to do a kind of constantly trying to do a forensic kind of uh, inspection of a capitalist system to find out what these symptoms which you see on the surface, like increasing inequality, where where those symptoms uh, mm -hmm. are coming from in terms of what's producing them. Yes, I see. Um, may I ask, when, uh, like recently we spoke to Al Gore, we spoke to Al Gore about climate change. Al Gore, uh, like, talking to us about like how, you know, in a sense, I suppose he's a uh, raison d'etre and explicit mission, which seems to have a, some nobility about it, is to galvanise and enthuse people about being sort of responsible. But when I was talking to Al Gore, I uh, kept thinking and in fact saying yeah but hold on a minute if you need that to stop can't you there's not there got to be sort of some stern and, and definitive regulation of that otherwise it will just carry on like and in this case regu like defiant and absolute regulation of energy uh, companies certain kinds of trade certain kinds of labor so in in capital is it dealing with like saying well there's no point just asking people of you know turn the tap off while they clean their teeth it's much more important to say well you can't have that amount of profit you can't operate in that way is that what is that does that critique reach those kind that, of that, that's a, that's a very good uh, point i mean uh, my view of uh, al gore is that he thinks that you can actually solve the climate change problem within the parameters of a capitalist system mm. and that he doesn't want to you know, do away with capitalism. He was, he's trying to protect capitalism from the consequences of climate change. Yeah. Whereas I take the view that the, the main producer of climate change is, of course, the driving force of capital accumulation. And until you've dealt with the driving force of capital accumulation, you're going to get all these promises about you know new technologies which are going to solve the problem and, and so on. Uh, but you're not going to get a fundamental kind of a solution without challenging capital itself. So it's kind of futile, isn't it? And it's sort of sort of using the means of a kind of a contemporary consumer society in that it's about your individual choice and you should individually recycle and individually do that make yes, these kind of choices right. um there's a thing i'm very interested in and i keep asking people about it and they don't know so i'll ask you there's this thing i read gandhi said they went this is him no point us kicking out the british and then us just doing their job for them uh what India is, is a country of 70,000 villages that's built on craft economies where everybody works all the time. We have to focus less on mass production and think instead of production for the masses. And to do this, we're going to have to break our spell with commodification. As long as people are thinking we've got to get more and more stuff, right. we're going to be in trouble. Now, that is where it starts to interface with the individual. But I like this thing he said about 70,000 village, each one auto auto autonomous, independent and trading only in excess and being where possible self-sufficient. What's he saying there, Gandhi? Is, this, is that coming well, from? Well, it, it, it's, it's a utopian vision in some ways, and I'm not against utopian visions. You well, need that sort of thing. a bit out of order if you were. Yeah, right. I hate utopia. <laughs> oh, you do? Oh, I, I know. I kind of I like a little bit of utopianism. Yeah, it's once kind in a while, every good, half hour. No, I love it. I don't, I don't entirely lie, rely on it. And, and I think that, that, that what, what Gandhi is saying is that there is a way of organising production and consumption which is radically different from that which is given by the industrialisation model. And he was faced with uh, you know, Nehru and developmentalism, which was to bring in factories and solve the problem that way. And uh, Gandhi saying, no, there was another kind of solution. Where I think there's a, there's a problem with, with that is in a situation of very strong population change and population growth. Yeah, the 70,000 villages, well, but they're, they're growing. And, and, uh, uh, they're, and there are other issues which arise, like uh, how, how, do you, how do you deal with local famines under circumstances of that kind? I mean, if you get crop failures amongst, say, 20,000 villages in a certain part, then how, how do you support? Uh, what happens there. So the, the, his assumption is that there'll never be a crop failure, whereas historically there are crop failures because of climate issues and other malpractices yeah. and things like that. So you need to have uh, an organisation that can deal with the, with the possibility of crop failures and, and, and can redistribute uh, wealth between the villages when it's, when it's really necessary. And the other difficulty is when they're independent and autonomous villages, some of the villages will start to get very affluent and very rich and some of them will get very poor. What are you going to do about the inequalities of incomes between different villages? So Gandhi didn't 
think about uh, those those sorts of things. And I and I think you have to think about a form of organisation that will put all those village economies together. So you uh, believe that that like a, a anarcho syndicalism. It, it is, I suppose, a version of what Gandhi was talking about. I, you could go to anarcho-syndicalism from, from from what he's talking about. I don't think he would want no? that at all. But 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 you could move in that direction. And of course, there's a lot of interest these days in in solidarity economies and autonomous uh, development in this place. And uh, you know, and there's a there's a great faith in autonomy. Uh, that somehow or other autonomy is going to be the solution. And my answer to that is I think autonomy is a good thing when you know what you're doing with it, but it's not the solution because if you don't have auto relations between autonomous groups, you're going to get a great deal of inequality. You're going to get the famine problem. You're going to get all sorts of issues of this kind uh, which have to be solved by, by integrating uh, local economies with each other in such a way that they can mutually support each other in times of difficulty. And so, there's a, so presumably what you're arguing for um, 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 what capital is arguing for is the, uh, the, the the role of the state that the state has to have a benevolent and redistributive role not well, that capitalism well, doesn't there, there have to, well put it this way there have to be mechanisms of, of, of redistribution and, and and the like and and mutual support and that has to be organized. Now, when you use the term state, we often think about the capitalist state. And I don't like the capitalist state. But we do need a form of governments and governmental inter interventions. And I like some of these things where they talk about, you know, Murray Bookchin, for example, had this idea about municipal socialism or, and, and, and local socialism. That is, you'd have autonomous uh, assemblies, but then there would be a super assembly that would, would start to deal with the relations between. Yeah. And, and then you'd have a super, super assembly in which, uh, you know, what's happening in, uh, say, North America gets connected with what's happening in South Africa and, and issues like climate change are addressed because you need an, a, a global organisation to deal with the climate change problem. It's not going to be dealt with simply by, you know, everybody changing behaviour, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So, so, you need, so you need some form of, of governmental structure of coordination. Uh, and, yeah. I, and I think uh, uh, the autonomy argument is, is powerful up to a point, but it needs to go much further. When I say that, then people say, oh, well, you're in favour of the capitalist state and you just want to give state power and we know the state is a disaster. And yes, well, the current state is a disaster. It's an instrument of capitalist domination. Huh. And more so, I think, now than it was even in the 19th century. And we see it being militarised so it can suppress social opposition and social movements. And, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm really against the, the kind of capitalist state. But but that doesn't mean I'm against some sort of form of government uh, 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 that can deal with these much broader global kind of problems. How would you, how would we ever arrive at that? How would there, how would we have a form of state that was benevolent and acting in the interests of its population? And, and can you now answer a question you must be continually called upon to answer that where, you know, like I'm glad that you did this distinctions between socialism, Marxism and communism. You know, how do you address the great failures of communism in the last century? Well, first off, I don't think uh, necessarily that communism was a great failure. Uh, that's you know what I mean? I mean, like all the you know Stalinist <coughs> gulags. Yes. That. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. There, there were you know some very very bad parts of that history. Uh, on the other hand, I think what was interesting was after the collapse of the Soviet Union, life expectancy in the Soviet Union went down in Russia. You know, enormously, a lot of people there suddenly found all their rights had disappeared. I mean, so so I think we we are wrong to kind of say everything that the communists did was 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 terrible. You think that mostly I've been propagandized, like that my perception of what happened in uh, the co communist yeah. Soviet Union yeah. over that century has been editorialized yeah. and I don't really understand it because it does I mean because I don't know I know yeah, the look, information look I'm not I, you know, I don't want to get in a situation of saying everything was great and wonderful and uh, no criticism but if you look at a place like Cuba and you look at healthcare delivery in Cuba it's fantastic yeah they good at vibe at as well education ed, you know and, and so there's some very good things there there clearly are some good things um, but like I think uh, don't we have to address the, some of the things that seem like I, I saw this good thing on the telly once where the woman that was doing the documentary said it seems that communism, uh, Soviet communism, 
uh, unconsciously or inadvertently mimicked the, the uh, social structure that had immediately preceded it of czarism in that in spite of its declared objectives, yeah. it had yeah. hierarchical yeah. structures yeah. and did lead to a, a oppression right. and persecution right. of a sort of... Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I don't deny a lot of that, but I do uh, think that uh, we we have to, you know, give uh, cr credibility to some of the things that happened under communism. Some of the other thing I have to say is this: uh, the reason that most of us have the standard of living we we have today is because of the communist threat. If the communist threat had not been there after 1945, uh, you know, we wouldn't have had uh, the delivery of the welfare state such as it was and all those kinds of mm. things which allow us uh, increasing life expectancy. And it's interesting that over the last few years, life expectancy has been going down in some of the major capitalist countries. Britain, for example, Cameron, I think, is the first prime minister to leave with a lower life expectancy than when he came in. Well, I think his has gone up. You should see the armed guards outside his house. Yes. Nothing's happening to that geezer. Let me tell you, there's old Bill crawling around everywhere. And there's an ambulance on duty. I can't know what's happened to everyone else in Labrook Grove. They must be terrified. All the old Bill are outside one house. Right. right. Um, but look, David, uh, this is the thing, you know, because I basically, my position, amorphous though it may be, and insubstantiated as it will continue to be, is this, that we need radical change. Yes. And, uh, and part of that does seem to be the dismantling of the capitalist state and yes. a new system based yes. on sharing. But yes. when we even appear to have an allegiance to, uh, like, uh, like anything, uh, an umbrella under which, you know, Stalinism or, uh, like, you know, me, I'd love a bit of Che Guevara, but you can't try saying that in Miami. People, uh, the kickback's pretty fierce. You know, like because, like because of the flaws, and because of uh, you know, like you know, like we've been. I grew up in the eighties and Cold War, which was you know obviously a, a tale of the two sides. Like so, I like, I find it very hard to unpick that, and, and and anything that seems revivalist or nostalgic about a communism that's already yeah. happened, I think people are like, no thanks, mate. Oh, I, 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 I don't want to do that. I mean, I I'm I'm I've been interested in some of these uh, programs that, for example. Uh, in in northern Syria, the, the Kurds have reorganized things along a kind of uh, assembly structures, uh, partly inspired by the, an alternative notion of democracy. I think that right now uh, some of the progressive mayors in Spain are trying to come up with a way of creating more democratic uh, assembly structures. So I think there's a lot of experimentation that needs to be done on things like that. Mm. I think the big problem with communism was they had a, what I call a single bullet theory of social change, which was uh, put in classic Marxist terms that the productive forces, that is, if you could command production, then you'd really, the rest of society would take care of everything in a, in a proper kind of way. I think we have to work on, on, on a whole range of different uh, issues, uh, including sort of culture, relation to nature. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with a problem right now, which is fundamental to me, which is what I would call global alienation, the alienation of populations politically from their jobs, from their daily life possibilities. And, and you've got alienated populations all over the world who then do crazy things sometimes, you know, they can be passive for a while and then something happens and you get these sort of seemingly irrational outbreaks of, uh, of craziness and they are elect uh, Donald Trump and do things like that. So I think alienation is one of the big, big issues. And when you have populations that are alienated, then, then you can't address it by sort of saying, oh, vote communist. Because that, that, they're as, they're as alien, people are as, as alienated from political parties like, like the communist parties and so on as they are from anything else. So it's hard then to rebuild some sort of uh, trust with alienated populations. And that's a lot of a political work to do. And, and I think there's an interesting distinction uh, for me between uh, what might be called uh, social media as a form of communication and social media leading to forms of organization. Mm. The f communicative forms are very good. The organizational forms are very bad right now. And yes. we've really got to think about how to, how to construct organizational forms. And I agree with you entirely. I'm not nostalgic about, you know, what the communists did, except that, you know, when it comes to health care and, and, and that kind of thing, I'd say, well, we should look at how the Q Cubans did it, and, or, and education. We should look at how the Cubans did it. Yes, I understand. You're enamoured by the beauty of the original idea, the veracity yes. of the cri critique, and the pos possibility of components of it 
You said that great. Can somebody take that down? I <laughs> say so that's what I'm interested it's in. All been, uh, like it's it. all been recorded. It's all been recorded. <laughs> okay. Thank you, though, for the endorsement. That's going on the poster. <laughs> you said that great. I'm going to give that in as a thing. Uh, as my PhD. I'm not doing a PhD. I'm doing the other one that begins with M. <laughs> I'm really going to have to start listening in those lectures. Um, uh, that is, yes, that you like that. And... Uh, Oh, the compliment. I'm so ego-led. If someone's nice to me, it takes me about an hour to recover <laughs> from my graces because I've been given a compliment. Let's just take a while to reflect on the compliment and uh, then we'll move on with the interview. Now, my point is is that w- that's, uh, what's needed is something that, whilst it may be derived from a capital, capital a book that I've only just learned to say correctly and now you've uh, made me undo it, uh, like uh, that, I suppose, David, the thing that sort of... Uh, that, interest me the reason i'm doing this podcast is i sense that change is possible i sense that we are being lied to i i, I can feel the, the the argument that you made about alienation it's so it's so in evidence um and I, I went to that cuba when i was quite young 22 and it was magnificent i was there of all things to record a chewing gum commercial the most oh. vacuous product imaginable, not even nutrition, right. just the act of mastication right. as a ritual and an idea while people starve. And while there, luckily I'm a drug addict, so that was then, I'm clean now. So that means that wherever I go, I have to go and find the people that know where the drugs are. So that means you have to get off the rails, you have to go down the rabbit hole. So I found myself in these things called barrios in Havana, and I liked it. I liked the people and I liked the uh, murals and there was a sense of joy and glory and potentiality and cars from the 50s, why not? And streets painted by people and this presence of people and people's creativity. Right. And as you say, the absence of that alienation that comes when you don't participate in your city, when you don't participate in your culture, when you know you have no power, when you know you have no meaning, how lost you feel. I, I felt something different then, but I was on drugs, so you know all of my experiences <laughs> were being filtered through drugs. Uh, but uh, you know, and that's before I knew that they had bloody good dental care. You know, like you know all of that. But what I feel like when we're posing uh, 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 an idea to people now, I, I think what like in there, what what did. Uh, Lenin, Trotsky, the Bolsheviks, etc., take from that book Capital and use in the the revolution in communism. And how did it become, you know, like a, the, the the failure that it became? Even if you take as failure the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Union, and what's happening in Russia now? Yeah, see that that's a question I I often get asked and I back away from. I uh, kind of say I kind of say, look, uh, you know, Lenin and Trotsky and Bukharin and all these people, they read Capital and they took certain things from them and they did certain things from them. Our job right now is to read Capital and find out what we want to do with it. What shall we do? Yeah, well, what, what first, the best off, bits? first off, you've got to learn how to read it, you know, and 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 that is not. Initially, an easy thing. That's why I hope some of the things I write help people get into it. That's and, going to be vital because no one's and, going to read it. You're going to have to do that. That's really important. Yeah, and 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 uh, you know, and I have these things on the web where you can do the you can uh, there's a course on Marxist Capital Volume One and Volume Two on the web, you know, and you can take it on the web. Mm. Um, so so yeah, open it up. But in the process. Make sure that we understand what it is that that, that Marx is really teaching us about uh, the nature of this system, and that, you know that, that comes back to the. It's not what it appears to be on the surface. Can we develop a way of critique so that I want to I want to educate people if I can, not necessarily to regurgitate Marx because that's not the point, but to use his mode of an analysis so that you can start to see okay. These populations are alienated. Why are they alienated? Where does the alienation come from? What's it got to do with the nature of the labour process? Why is the labour process the way it is these days? Why did capitalist technology decide that it wanted a labour process which disempowered the labourer? Yeah. Why yeah. is why is that there? Yeah. Why is it as and, and, and Marx has this wonderful thing where he starts off one of his chapters and he kind of says, John Stuart Mill has this problem. He says, Look, we have all this labor saving machinery right now, and you would have thought this labor saving machinery would lighten the load of labor. And John Stuart says, But the funny thing is, is it seems that it doesn't. That actually it makes a lot of the laborer worse. And Marx says, Well of course it does. Because the purpose of the machinery is not to lighten the load of labor, it's to extract 
more value and more surplus value and more profit from the labourer. So, of course, if the machine can help you do that, then that's what it does. Yes. So this is what, So this gives you an understanding of capitalist technology, which evaded John Stuart Mill, but which Marx sees very clearly, yes. and we see very clearly, and say, actually, the purpose of technological change, yeah, well, I mean, there are all kinds of purposes, but with military and all the rest of it in there, but one of the big purposes of it is to disempower the labourer. Yes. And, yes. And when the labourer is disempowered, guess what? They become alienated. Yes. Guess what? They start behaving in an alienated way. You know, I mean, when you've got these things sort of going on, you're kind of saying, well, these are the kinds of insights that come out of reading Marx's Capital. And you kind of go, wow, you know, once I've got that insight, I can't look at any discussion of technological change and imagine it's got some socialist utopia attached to it, as, you know, some of the people are writing these days do. The, the artificial intelligence is the new you know, socialist utopia. You know, well, you see what happens. Something like Uber, Uber, Uber starts as a kind of sharing economy, and the next thing you know, it's become capitalised, and somebody's become a billionaire out of it. You've got to admire the go. malleability of the system. It is good, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying capitalism good morally, ethically, uh, or oh, spiritually. Oh, it's slick. It's slick. It's very, it's very adaptable. Slick. Anything. It can take anything. Yeah. Like, I, I, my understanding of it is primarily of the way that it interacts with culture and creativity yeah. and how you can see mimicked in its narrative the uh, uh, essential flaw, i.e., for example, take hip-hop, which begins as sort of very defiant, then goes through a stage of being utopian and beautiful, and then it becomes commodified, becomes clearly a product, and to some degree about products, and about commerce, and about acquisition, and about like, it's, the ideology is so endemic, so all-encompassing, that it becomes invisible. So you say that part of capitalism's DNA is its own concealment. Its own yes. concealment is a, it's a primary function. Once it's concealed itself, it can continue. Now what I think is, you know, when people talk about you know the system and the flaws of the system, who like it, obviously when you say you know about technology's role, it's te technology. You know, John Stuart Mill's all baffled by it, but Marx goes, no, 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 it's doing its job perfectly. Or is that not true of bureaucracy and, and systems of control? For someone, this system, for some people, for some groups, some institutions, this system is brilliant. It's working a hundred percent effectively. Right. Oh yeah, but what about climate change? No problem. What about alienation, inequality, riots, death, murder, dec decimation? No problem. So who is this strata for whom this system is beneficial? Who are they? How do we influence, control, diminish, limit, oppose them? That's the subject of your PhD. <laughs> That's what you've got to do. That's what you've got to sort out. No, I mean, I can give some preliminary sort of answers to those questions. Write this down. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's an it's, it's, I mean, you're in a great position to, to, to take that sort of stuff on. Am I? Big time. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, you know, you're, you're close. I mean, it's very important when you're doing a PhD to, 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 to be in love with the matter you're doing, you know, because otherwise... Russell Brand. Myself by me, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is which is fine, which is what it should be about in some ways. So uh, I think it, it's, uh, but yeah, who who benefits? Well, you can see who 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 extracts wealth from it. I mean, how how, right. how wealth gets gets you know, how Jeff Bezos gets his money and how he? he's the guy who runs Amazon, right? And and Amazon. and. God. Bloody good though, aren't they, Amazon? But they're, they're part of the problem. They won't yeah. pay any bloody tax. They're too bloody big. They're controlling yeah. everything. Yeah. So that would have to go. And, and how Google and, and all these other monopolies are kind of being set up. So they've been set up in such a way. And 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 actually, you know, I, I use use them. You know, yeah, how can we you not? Them. We have to use not? them. At the same time, uh, value is being extracted from us. A kind of rent is being taken away from us, mm. uh, and 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 so we've got these 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 systems now, which 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 you know, and and I think particularly in the cultural field and so on, the the the, the forms of exploitation and appropriation are are are, are becoming you know pretty 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 chronic. I mean, they've been that way for quite a while, but it seems to me. Right now, particularly given the problems that I mentioned earlier, that capital's running out of places to go and new things to do. Just geographically. Geographically. Uh, and, and actually, it's increasingly relying upon, you know, culture, to the production and, 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 and commodification of culture. How and, do you mean? And what does that mean? What do you mean by that, the commodification of culture? Well, well for, for example, if, if, if uh, we want to have a short turnover time or something, then, then a spectacle is instantaneously consumed. It's gone. 
It's not like my grandmother's knives and forks. It doesn't last 150 years, you know. It's just, the, the Olympic Games or something like that yeah. becomes, becomes a, a big mode of capital accumulation. Vast amounts of money goes into rebuilding the infrastructures and doing all the things that the construction interest wants to do. Yeah. Then the Olympic Games are 10 days. It's all gone. Where's, yeah. the, where's the next games? And we've where's got that running track round uh, our pitch. <laughs> and 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 and, and uh, how many how many uh, biennales are there now? And every city has a biennale what exhibition, biennale? a cultural, you know, like Venice uh, exhibition or the Shanghai exhibition, and the and and so and so you suddenly find the, the whole kind of cultural realm is being used as a as a sort of commodification, real estate development kind of uh, a scam. Yes. So it's like, like it, I see. It's like that there's a, a matrix of commodification that's applied to everything and you can see its prints, fingerprints, if it would have anything as organic as fingers on, on everything. Yes. Like football being a, a great example. Yes. How like, you know, if you listen to Talk Sport, which is obviously, I think, now owned by sort of Sky and stuff, this the sort of delicious, cruel irony of like what everyone is talking about all the time is, oh, it's just the old game's about bloody money. It's the old game's about money. And like the way that sort of like the way that football looks now, and of course the amount players earn, but I mean, there's one of a few ways a working class person has a chance of earning any money is to become a, a world class footballer. But so that's, that's not my point. But my point is that somehow... The essence of the game is surviving this process of commodification, how the experience is being turned into a product, how even its roots in community, its tribal roots, its roots uh, as a congregational activity, a, a space right. for union and togetherness, right. is, is again, layer after layer of commerce wrapped around it. The players appearing in the adverts, the adverts yeah. on the shirts, you know, how long before the pitch has adverts on it, how long, you know, like sort of it's... it's creeping through our consciousness it's everywhere and one of the things I think as well is I feel like growing up when I did I commodify people I think I I have to unco I have to consciously unstitch my tendency to look at people and think well what are you going to do for me what are you yeah. going to give me right. something right. can right. I have sex with you right. I'm not thinking this now David I'm, <laughs> I've changed I'm married now like I try not to look at people as commodities right. that's one of the things one of the flaws you know you talk about on one hand the alienation that people understand yeah. oh no I'm absolutely expendable my role is meaningless i am only a piece of this machinery an organic piece of matter in a machine but the other side of that is that we start to look at each other as commodities that we yeah. lose the a diff the lens of humanity yeah if you said to me you know what's the central kind of pol politics i'd like to see i'd say well, i want a politics of decommodification that is what's happened over the last 30 40 years education has become more and more of a commodity it should stop being a commodity. It should be a free good to everybody. Healthcare is now is a commodity. It should be a free good to everybody. In other words, we should start to decommodify whole sectors of the economy. Now that's that's socialism. That's not communism. That's socialism. Mm -hmm. That's that that's a socialist pro project. And you're right. We should also stop de you know start decommodifying others so that we start to look at others as people instead of instruments of our own you know uh, our own activities and, and, and trying to ex exploit Because uh, yes. if our economic ideology requires that it does things as sort of biological and psychological as stimulate limitless need and desire in right. order to perpetuate right. itself then it has also colonised the consciousness yes. and the lives Absolutely. of the individuals beyond their economic yeah. role because yes. it requires their spiritual role yeah. be beholden to yes. its ideology yes. also no, And I think the decolonisation of uh, and, and the decommodification, it, uh, those are the kinds of general f fields of endeavour which we can start to do things on right now. How know. do we do it? Well, you know, we can even get the Labour Party to start to go really strongly, I mean, abolish student debt, for mm. example. There was talk of this. There's talk of it, yeah. Well, stop having talk about it, do, do it. Do that. You know. Do the same with, uh, you know, make sure that uh, there's enough money goes into healthcare so that it's really uh, a non commodified sector and we, you get rid of the secondary kind of privatized thing, which the get conservatives. Get rid of that. Yeah. Get, get, so the conservatives, you know, want to use that as a way of sort of chewing away at the National Health Service so that you don't, uh, you know. So there's a. There are, there, 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 are, there are real politics that, that can have short, even in the short term, or you can imagine sort of a radical uh, beginning. And, and if people start to think 
in terms of decommodification, just over something like education or healthcare. And you can extend it a bit more to housing and then actually to basic uh, food, uh, which, which, you know, the Cubans did, by the way. Oh, yes. With a ration book, and their ration book gave you a certain basic amount of rice and so on, and it's not working too well right now, but, but it's, it was a basic, you know, food kind of uh, allocation that everybody had. So do things like this. And, 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 uh, and we could do it. You know when like, the people come out of a cult, like Scientology or you know uh, another right. cult, they have to sit them down with someone who goes, all that stuff you've been wired up with, it's not true. And they <laughs> come back to your mum and dad yeah. or yeah. whatever it is. Now, how are we going to unstitch the conditioning generation, generation deep? I when I like sometimes just to make myself feel better, really go and talk to young people and like you know give them bend their ears about my views. One of the things that's very uh, difficult for me. Uh, as someone, you know, I'm in my 40s now and I try to feel like I'm a person that has access to the young and I feel like I can affect people is to recognise how, like, they are indoctrinated. Yeah. Like, they want right. the phone. Don't tell them that they don't want the right. phone because they want it, you know. Right. How much you earn. They, so they think about money. Right. They, why would they not? How right. could they not? Right. How do we begin to... Because, see, this thing you said, the thing you like most about Marxist analysis is that it's veracity and its ability to deconstruct, critique and right. reveal essence, epiphany, the revelation of essence. Since the revelation right. of real truth. Right. How are we going to wade through the layers of inculcation that lacquers their minds? I think you start at various, in various ways. I mean, I think Marx's answer to this is, first off, you should start to try to identify certain kind of practices, which are very simple practices, uh, over things like, you know, using people in instrumental ways instead of relating to them as human beings, you know, that, that these these... These changes can, you know, so the realm of practices is very important, and that can be all over the place. The second thing is to start to actually have uh, a, a political movement which kind of says, you know, we don't have to actually create human beings of the sort that we're creating right now with a kind of neoliberal ethic and all of that, and, and we, we can do things rather differently and get people to read. I mean, you mentioned Gandhi. People sometimes read Gandhi and get really transformed by it in terms of starting to think about the world in a different kind of way. And so there's an educational process which then gets embedded in a political movement. And I think that is then starts to be important, and uh, that political movement can start to have effects by orchestrating new forms of governance and democracy and the like. For mm. instance, if you look at what's going on in Barcelona, you've got a radical mayor, and she's trying to set up uh, kind of uh, new forms of democratic uh, consultation within the city. Is it working there? It's only I know, just like Spain's been, been in crisis, hasn't it? it? Yes, it's only just started. Uh, they only just started working on this, but this is one of the, the projects they have. So, but that, but that project comes out of a bunch of people who started to develop small practices on the ground who got together and kind of said, look, we need to do something really radically different. I mean, the mayor comes out of the anti-foreclosure movement. She's, she's very, very progressive and she's got a bit of a progressive alliance behind her. And so new things can be, be set up. And it's, it's very interesting to me. You know, I'm interested in urban. There's a lot of radical mayors around the world. I mean, even places like Seattle and Los Angeles have radical councils now who are starting to do things at a very different level, just at the local level level. And I, this is the way in which it, it, this, you know, a, a political movement can't be taught from the top down. It's got to get sort of, it's got to develop organically somehow. Rather, I agree with in you. In people's daily lives. Do you not think that that means to a degree then that power has to be closer to people oh. and that Yes. And then the, yes. so the idea of state power, even if apparently yes. benevolent, is always going to seem yes. somehow abstract. Yes. And, and, and then, you, then, then, you know, to me, it's more a dialectical kind of relationship between some sort of centralized state power. So somebody like who's a mayor of a city has a certain kind of centralized power, but rests very much upon, you know, local neighborhood movements. Then what happens is those movements try to do certain things and they get support. They need crucial support from what the mayor can do. So if you want to develop a new housing complex, which is a non commodity housing development of affordable housing. Mm. You probably need the city to help you acquire the land. And, and if the city helps you acquire the land, then the city is doing its job. So there's a, 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 a relationship of certain kind. Do you think then that what you're saying, is it curious, do you think, David, that this uh, sort of forms of more localised or at least citywide government, for, for me, I would take with my particular code that that's an indication that what's required is, is decentralised, more decentralised power, and perhaps this is the end of the nation 
nation state. I mean, when you sort of look at what's happening in America and in certain strands of British politics, that, that like, can you see perhaps that within the the Brexit impulse, sort of a, a certain positivity in that people want to unpick themselves? I know there's many reasons for Brexit or whatever, but on some level, it's a kind of decentralisation, yes. right. power being closer to people, people having a degree of authority in their own lives. Is yeah, but I don't believe in a de decentralisation as a as an absolute. I mean, because uh, actually it turns out that one of the best ways you can orchestrate centralised control is through decentralisation. Huh. When you think about it, and the market is a very decentralised system. Ooh. And of course, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually compatible with incredible concentrations of political and economic power. So, so I don't think decentralisation in itself is the answer. I think that some level of decent in a situation where there's not any decentralization, we go for decentralization. It's and centralized then by its ideology, though, isn't it? It has such a clear mandate. It's yeah. such a simplistic I, mandate: extract profit, extract profit. Like you know that 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 itself is preta geographical. It's be, like it can't be contained. You can't. You, and and I suppose any attempts to regulate it at a national level or local level are always resisted. Yeah. Now, another thing is, say like for a moment when you said there, like that if we had a political party that was like, you know, overtly committed to, so, you know, sort of uh, like, you know, some of the basics. Um, how do you think in government, in government, such a, a, a nation and such an ideology would survive? When, like after what happened yeah. in Greece yeah, and yeah. Syriza and all that? yeah. yeah. Well, you know, again, that's one of the big uh, issues. You get these very progressive uh, movements and they get political power and then they find political power is constrained in certain ways and the finances are such that they have to do things so they become just like, you know, everybody else. And we've mm. seen that, you know, with the history of the Labour Party when it came into power, it started to be very much more, you know, pro-capitalist. So, yes. I, I, so I, th I, I think uh, at that point the, the whole kind of revolutionary impulse has to be taken uh, more more seriously, and to say a, 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 par a reformist party uh, should look f to create what I would call revolutionary reforms. That those those reforms which open the pathway towards further reform. You know, would those reforms be? What would you prioritise? The establishment of like benevolent state institutions around health and education. I can see how important that is, but is it? not equally important given what we've discussed that to have powerful draconian regulation of enterprise yeah no i'm not in i i'm not against uh regulating what uh, the capitalist class is doing uh, i'm very much in favor what, of what does that sound like well it it, it sounds like uh, for example that uh, you put strict rules on pollution and uh, you put strict rules on things like uh, occupational safety and health conditions in in factories and and the like so strict you know, regulation strict of, of regulation, around their behavior yeah. so that yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, around those, pay? those hmm? around pay as well. Uh, well, I, 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 yeah. I mean, I would like to see a. Uh, I mean, wouldn't what? What kind of world would it be if uh, actually something like the Mondragon uh, principle, which what was which started out, well, it's a big cooperative that became bigger and bigger and bigger, and originated in Spain, and the rule was that the salary differential should be no more than one to three. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Now, recently it's gone to one to nine, so you <laughs> see the kind of pressures on it. But one to three. Imagine if all corporations had to work under the, under the rule that uh, the, the rate of return to people in the corporation should uh, not be more than one to three. Right now, big corporation heads get something like 300 or 400 times what the average they're going to hate that idea. Of course they're going to hate that idea. But, but you're know, earning millions. But Wait, you, hold on. <laughs> but you legislate it and so kind of say, okay, here's the, here's the situation. Yes. And we would be, be living in a radically different world if, we, if, if all... If, 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 hey, you know, and right now it's, it's scandalous. I mean, you have this scandal also going on here about you know, how much uh, the heads of uh, universities are paid. Oh, is there a scandal? Yeah. They're earning a lot, are they? They're earning huge amounts, yeah. May, and and, Why, and at, the same, at the same time, at the same time, they're cutting cutting back on 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 number of faculty they hire. You know, because oh you know. it's very uh, seductive, isn't it? Yeah, it's well, very it's seductive. Become, Everyone gets lured in. Yeah, yeah. Become a become a. I've president. been lured right in. <laughs> it's very difficult not to get lured in. Yep. Like you sort of like you know like I knew it was wrong prior to having money, and I knew also that it wouldn't work as well. And then when you sort of get it, the comfort you see. 
The no. seduction of comfort. I, I, yeah, the I illusion of, of it. I, won't, I, I confess I have some of that too. Do you? And that's yeah. why I thank you very much. That's why that's, the, 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 there's a component to this I always harp on about. Where the, and the, the only way to engender real change, deep change, is not through, I don't think is through analysis and critique because I think people sort of know. I think they know. But like for them to understand that change is possible, I think you have to make people feel differently. Yeah. And like, you know, there's sort of the antithesis of the alienation that you just yeah. described. Now, there's a moment in any kind of revolutionary process where, where, yeah, you're right. If people don't feel differently, then it's gone. Yes. So I wonder how, like, I mean, you've mentioned as well, there is the, the possibility for mass communication. There are some. Se- look, I was one of the things I was trying to do when I like you know was more overtly evolved in political conversation is I was trying to find grandstand, flash, obvious, blatant, blunt things that people thought, oh my god, you could do that. Like, and one of the things you know that group called uh, Adbusters, they're some yeah. sort of, okay, yeah, yeah. they would sort of say things like kill a corporation, and there's, there's something about it made me sort of tingle with excitement. Is that they would say identify a corporation that is not popular, Dem- a campaign like sort of almost like when we're campaigning for hospitals or on behalf of unions, it's sort. Of, it exists within a milieu that they know how to manage. Like I, I feel like a targeted campaign that was like, our role is we are going to crash, collapse, undermine, disemble. You know, Apple is a difficult one because we've all got them and they're so bloody right. popular. Yes. We've all got them. We're all tacked up in it. Right. Um, but like, do you see like that there could be like that these ideas? Is there any potential for that? Like to introduce these kind of ideas? Like, you know, because it's hard for me to look at Google and Amazon with animosity. You know, like, even though I know why don't they pay their taxes? Why won't they? You know, you know because I, like those logos, those brands, those stories, the convenience, the comfort. It's so seductive, David. How do you like? You know, like people were like when I talk to black cab drivers, you know, and like, you know, sort of like, yeah, bloody hell, one of the few ways that working people can have an honest job. And then like, you know, Uber, so creepingly convenient. Right. What do we do? How do you ask people, you know, like, how do you get people to change the way they see the world without some sort of different vehicle into their hearts? Well, you can you can boycott Uber or something like that. Uh, that, that would be uh, an interesting one. In fact, uh, they did get boycotted in New York City. It was very interesting. Oh, really? were, yeah. Uh, it was a day when uh, Trump declared that no Muslims were allowed from those countries and everybody was rushing out to the Kennedy airport to sort of, you know, lawyers and all this kind of stuff were turning up there. And uh, the, the regular cab drivers uh, went on strike for an hour. So, 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 and I actually arrived in Kennedy Airport when all this was happening. It was oh. impossible to get out because of the, uh, the cab drivers, but Uber broke the strike. And Uber came in, and next day, uh, social media was coming out and says, boycott Uber. Next day, Uber lost half its passengers because mm. cause they, cause they undermined the, the, the cab driver's strike uh, over the immigrant population. And I thought it was very interesting <laughs> that, yes. that, that that happened. So there is there, there are ways uh, to go with this. Opportunities and, will arise right. to, uh, to and, illustrate these points. And I, and I think sometimes these symbolic things are very important, and I, I'm all, all in favour of you know any kind of symbolic action. I mean, I think the Occupy movement was a symbolic movement, and I think it, it actually changed the discourse about inequality. Uh, it, it introduced the concept of the one percent into yes. into, into uh, they everybody understand it, and so well, you know a lot of people in the Occupy movement say it was a terrible, terrible failure, and you say no, it wasn't a failure. I mean, it did some things which were terribly important. Yeah, too soon to tell, yeah, as they say. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> may, I, like, may I may I run through like uh, the proper questions, like okay. so that make sure that we've covered everything because uh, you're so fascinating. Well, no, I'm it. enjoying it too. So, you oh know. yeah, yeah. Hello, we're loving it in here. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, right. So, like, look, Marx is capital. One of the most important texts of the modern era. Changed the destiny of countries, politics, people across the world. What are its key arguments? We better pick that up. I feel like we've covered it a bit, but do you think we've covered that? Yeah, I think we covered arguments. that. There's about it's about commodification. It's about accumulation of capital, circulation of capital, and how it has to grow, and technological change, yeah. and dynamism, and all of that. We've, we've done understood a lot that. On that. We've understood yeah. that. Do its ideas, the ideas of Das Kapital, capital, continue to resonate today? And if so, what do they still offer? Well, I, we, we talked about that too because uh, we said, you know, capital is more prevalent around the world now than it was back then. So in some ways, Marx is more important now because mm. the terrain on which it operates is much bigger.
covered that. Socialism, Marxism, communism, definitely done that. Considering the degree to which technological, economic and industrial changes occurred within the last 150 years, how might Marx's analysis and its application need to be modified? Do you want to do a little bit more of that? I, I, I think that the answer to it is not much. Uh, it's well, you're pretty right. accurate. You're, so you're orthodox, It's, it's you? a good... No, uh, the thing is that Marx... Well, yeah, Marx wrote a lot about what was going on in the 19th century, and that's dated. But he's <laughs> writing about when he's writing about capital, he's writing about a system which still exists mm-hmm. and which is even more powerful now than it was in his day. So, and in fact, possibly we can now see how it's see, played out. Yes, we go, right. bloody hell, he said that was going to happen. Now, there are some aspects uh, the, that Marx never got around to finishing doing on, for example, finance and the role of finance, where he wrote, he wrote some very fascinating stuff, but he never completed it. But we need to do that right now because the financial question is a much much bigger question now than it was in his day. Yes, thank you. Your work is said to be appreciated by anarchists and the Occup- and the Occupy movement as much as it is by Leninist party organisers. Why do you think this is? I have no idea, and you should ask them. Yeah, that's right. Well done for not being vain. You shouldn't have put that question in there, Gal. That makes us look sycophantic. I'm going to cross that out. <laughs> right, we'd leave it in the show, though. It makes us look uh, authentic. How has your anthropological and geographical background informed your teaching of Marx? That's really good. Yeah. I want to know that, actually. It's, actually, it, it's... it's uh, I mean... I have a I have a rather different take on Marx to a lot of people, and the reason is that I'm, I'm not primarily interested in Marx. I'm primarily interested in urbanization, uneven geographical development at world scale, local scale, and things of that kind. Mm. And I and I the only thing I like about Marx is it helps me understand all of that. Now, when there's something in Marx that doesn't help me understand all of that, I kind of push it to one side and say, kind of, I think this is probably a useless bit of Marx. Yeah, so I'm very much religion. I'm very much about I'm very much about Marx uh, as 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 a practical guide rather right. than as a grand practical. theoretician who's a pure theory person. So I, uh, so I that's because you come from different disciplines in anthropology and geography. Yeah, right. And thank God I'm not an economist. Yeah, that stuff's boring, isn't it? And it's yeah. made up and it's not right. a science and it's all just pretend. Now, uh, what about... Um, I like that breakfast thing that we were doing, like that you say, where'd your breakfast come from? It's good, isn't it? Like, because yeah. you sort of don't really think, oh, no, these beans, so oh, it's probably been through hell. And like that egg, oh no, it's all sorts has gone on. Yeah. Put you off it. Never yeah. mind a cocoa pop. Where does sugar come from? Yeah. Tate and Lyle, that couple of rab scallions. <laughs> wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. They've still got the whip marks in their hands. So it's been it's been said we're entering a post-capitalist era. Do we still live in a capitalist society? I can answer that one just after. Of course we do. It's got worse than ever. Oh, it's something that's yes. worse than capitalism, maybe right, you could yeah. say. Some right. sort of yeah. terrible, terrible behemoth. Yeah. Some cyborg, yeah. some horrible monster. There's always pretty horrible monsters. So it's uh, it's it, it's a monster that has some good effects sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Beyonce iPhones. I don't know. Like there's some yeah. good bits. I'm not blaming Beyonce. Will the current system ultimately prove to be fatal to us? I wish it, I could say yes, but the trouble is the capital can continue under the most dire conditions if people don't change it, and I, that's the point. That people have got to change it. It's it ain't going to change. Cockroach. It ain't going to change of its own accord. Right, uh, to change. What are some of the main contradictions at the heart of capitalism? We really covered that with the growth and the dynamism, Gareth. I can't believe that, because Gareth does this, he does all, he's the producer. Yeah, well, he's been reading it very hard. <laughs> Could you ever love me? Gareth, where are you going with this? <laughs> what about the argument that says capitalism's contradictions lead to the innovations that made it resilient? That's good. Where'd you get that from? Yeah, well, yeah. Look, there's a lot of invention going on under capitalism, and it's very use. Some of it's very useful. I mean, what would we do without Velcro and things like that? You know, I mean, Velcro. Like, <laughs> that's your example. Well, you know, it's trivial things like that. But on the other hand, if you're struggling and you've got a, 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 a broken arm and you need to fix it up, and you've got Velcro, boy, is it good! Oh, that's the most I've wanted to cuddle you in this entire interview. <laughs> you write about how cities are the heart of both capital and class struggles. How might cities be reorganised in more socially just and economic? Logically sane ways. Well, that's one of the big projects I think that we've got to have is how to redesign cities so that they're much more uh, available to the population, where they counter the alienations which currently exist about mm. uh, urban life. And uh, actually, it's interesting if you look at it over the last 30 years, most of the big movements that go around the world have been urban movements like Gezi Park, about what happened in, in Brazil uh, in, in uh, 2013. Uh, you know, so and, and even Occupy was a, much, a lot of it was about housing and urban questions, and and not about what's going on in the factory. Hmm, that's interesting. Wonder what that means. 
It means that actually that people are as concerned about the qualities of urban life as they are about the qualities of uh, their employment. Yes. And they've always they've always been involved in both. But one of the things that Marx was a bit of bias towards is he bias towards production, yes. and not necessarily because to, of the time he was writing, yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. So so I, I I would always want to correct that a bit in Marx. Also, perhaps because now the, the kind of economies in which these movements are occurring, there is no longer sort of mass production in the manner in which there was when Marx was writing. Now people yeah. work in more diverse. Well, you know, in 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 many parts of the world, uh, the 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 working class in the sense of factory labourer has, has disappeared as, as being central. Of course, not in China or Bangladesh and so on, but uh, in North America, yeah, the yeah. traditional working class has been much diminished. Yeah, he said, what did he say, Paul Gilbert? Was it Paul Gilbert? He said, uh, lanyard, the sort of the lanyard class. Right. He talked about as the new sort of working class. That was sort of an interesting thing we heard when we were doing the interviews. Sales of Das Capital, capital as we now call it, crossing out that D and making that kicking cur, a curly cur, have soared since the 2008 crash. Is Marxism on the rise? I think there's a much greater interest in it. And I think uh, it, the, the nadir was in the 1990s when it was very hard to get anybody to ever look at Marx's capital. But I think uh, since 2000, it's, it's gradually become important. And then the crisis of 2007, 2008, yeah. Here's some of these uh, big arguments against communism. In the 20th century, it's been directly responsible for killing 100 million people, did it? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that can be, you know, very negative yeah. things, you know. Like religion, and that causes Stalin, it, and, uh, and, and of course Mao made a, a huge mistake, uh, which led to the Great Famine in China, did where he? about 20 million people died. Mao, focus! You know, but but on the other hand, it also saved a lot of lives. I mean, the interesting thing about even about the China case, and people get mad at me when I say this. Yeah, okay, twenty million people probably died in the famine, which was unnecessary, bad policies, and all that. Stuff. On the other hand, when Mao came to power, life expectancy in China was thirty-five, and when he died, you know, life expectancy was sixty-five. So he did something right as well as. Yes, I see. Well. You feel like it's your personal role to redress much of the propagandized information yeah, that's yeah. taken as. And, and then the problem with the propaganda. It, 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 it emphasises all the negatives and it never says anything about what the positives were. And of we course, need new, as... more balanced propaganda. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> On right. the other hand... <laughs> no, you're, 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 I understand. One, capitalist economies are based on free exchange. This is a popular claim of capitalism. Is that true? Is it made up? Well, in principle it is, but in practice uh, a lot of it is monopoly power. Monopoly power, plus even people's right. the, the role of the right. consumer, they've been stimulated into a terrible state right. of desperation. Yeah. All right, um, I think we've covered. I think this is a, that's a, such a thorough interview I've done. Now, can I just before? I mean, not, not that we let you go, you'll continue to be free. But my mate John Rogers sent me this thing. Check out this and see if it makes sense. A number of people in Harringay have formed a company with the aim of buying a large bit of land that will otherwise be sold to a private developer. They will want to build loads of expensive housing in a part of Harringay, Tottenham, where local people can't afford them, Last gentrifying the area and kicking out local people. What we want to do is build 800 homes that are all genuinely affordable for local people and the site controlled by local people. Oh, hello. I could go on, he says, but if you need more info, you can go to... Uh, the website startharringay.co.uk we're actually serious about this that's a funny paragraph to put this late in uh, and we've got we've got solicitors, architects. We've been speaking to the mayor. Blah 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 blah. We need to pry, pile on pressure and publicity. So, what do you think about a project like that, where essentially I suppose their project is to have sort of a, 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 a to, to acquire some land to build eight hundred homes and sort of govern them? So again, it's going to be operating within like a metropolis that's got other systems of government at its heart. Um, I, you know, I'd like to know more details. Right, about you it. don't just make snap judgments. Yep. <laughs> like a problem, I mean, I, like an agony I, uncle. In a sense, in a sense, agony uncle. I, 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 I would support this kind of thing. I mean, in in the states, we have something called community land trust, which take, which means that people who are in those houses can't sell them. Mm. So I don't know whether that's in that proposal. Whether people, I bet it is. Yeah, yeah they can't probably, turn a quick profit on there. No. So so. Yeah, uh, you know, if, if people come in and they live there, then if they leave, then they just get back what they put in, and they, there's no kind of speculation on the land. So anything of that sort, I'm in favour of. Yeah, people where people have authority and power yeah. in their own lives right. and the ability to govern themselves yeah. where yeah. possible. But yeah, but if they, but uh, you sometimes find in those things where people look at the situation and say, well, under the rules of the game, I can't sell, and but if I could sell, I could make mega bucks. So therefore, the individuals try to then turn those collective things into things where they can. Mm. 
speculate and come out. I mean, it's so. curious, isn't it? Because in a way, capitalism, like most superficial and observable phenomena, are somehow sourced from the, our inner lives. Fear, greed. Well, it's partly that, but then, you know, if, if somebody's living there and they see that if they could make this back, turn this back into a market proposition, they could make a lot of money out of it, then, uh, you know, and they, they've got pressing needs, you know, medical needs or something like that, or they, you know, then, then they, they want to go market. Yes, yes, yes. I see. So, so it's not it's not just greed and, 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 and ideology and so on. People have real kind of needs. So. I suppose that's why you... Uh, are insistent on there being some kind of state role so that there is some sort of overarching principle so that well, people are Well, they have to have protected. a legal apparatus there that prevents them selling out at a market rate. That's some free advice from David Harvey that you've got there from your email. That was someone called Tony Wood, who's a friend of my mate, John Rogers. Uh, and finally, what five books have we got to read, Oh, please? that's a terrible... Well, that's you won't do ter it. Terrible, terrible. Well, I can, I can do it, um, but... You know, you should get into reading this stuff from any all kinds of different perspectives, uh, and and the sorts of things that I would sort of say is, uh, you you know, if you read uh, C. L. R. James on uh, uh, black Jacobins, uh, you know, this I mean, this is a kind of what does that mean? What is that? C. L. R. James it's an understanding. It's an understanding of Marx that comes from from the colonial experience. Ooh. Put it that way. And, and so anybody who's coming from that background, I think, would immediately get sucked into sort of appreciating the Marxist standpoint from that experience. I'd say the same thing about something, somebody like Silvia Federici, who has a book on Caliban and the Witch and, and another a more recent one called Point Zero, which is about the experience of women in the whole history of capital accumulation from the very origins to, to today. Again, you know, people would get into that and they would get a certain perspective on the Marxist position, which would come from, from that. And then I had, you know, from a humanist position, I'd say you read Terry Eagleton's book on uh, why Marx was right. Uh, where Marx, where he actually goes over the whole history of, uh, of, of, of Marx's humanist positions that he took and, and why he was right and, and corrects a lot of the bad propaganda that mm. you, you've talked about. And Don't then blame I'd, me for it. <laughs> then, I'd, then, I'd say, then I'd say, actually, I've got to give you a couple of mine. I think yeah. you, should, you should take uh, this last one, which is uh, uh, you know, Marx, Capital, and the Madness of Economic Reason. Uh, but then I would precede it by reading The Brief History of Neoliberalism, which is about the history of capital accumulation from the 1970s onwards. But it got up to about 2005, so it was before the crisis, whereas the, the new book has a, a final chapter which updates the, the neoliberalism book and what's happened to neoliberalism since 2005. So I would say... You know, you would get into get into things that way. So it's kind of a right a expedition of learning. I'm going to start with yours, Professor. Thank you so okay. much for coming well, on thank here. Thank you for having me. This it's has been brilliant. great. Well, you, have I? Hmm? Did you say I've been great or it's been yes, great? Yes, you've been great. All oh, right, brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Right, right. Hey, will you, why don't we go out and you reading this monologue from Shakespeare that you've um, concluded? That's right, out of, out of King John. How come you saw King John? I saw King John because a friend of mine took me there to listen to it, and it's not a great play, but on the other hand, there's this great speech in the middle of it. It goes like this. Mad world, mad kings, mad composition. That smooth-faced gentleman, tickling commodity... Commodity, the bias of the world, the world who of itself is paced well, made to run even upon even ground, till this advantage, this vile drawing bias, this sway of motion, this commodity, makes it take heed from all indifferency, from all direction, purpose, course, intent. And this same bias, this commodity, this board, this broker, this all-changing word. And why rail I on this commodity? But for because he hath not wooed me yet, not that I have the power to clutch my hand when his fair angels would salute my palm, but for my hand is unattempted yet, like a poor beggar, raileth on the rich. Mm. Well, whilst I'm a beggar, I will rail and say, here is no sin but to be rich. And being rich, my virtue then shall be to say there is no vice but beggary. Since kings break faith upon commodity, gain be my lord, for I will worship thee. Yes. It's a great quote. And, of course, the first line of Marx's capital is... Don't look to me for that. You're the oh, bloody you're professor. You're supposed to know it now. You're supposed to know it. You're supposed <laughs> to know it. <laughs> the first line is that the wealth of the world in which we're looking at here appears 
and of great accumulation of commodities. All right. Shakespeare, Karl Marx, Professor David Harvey, thank you very much for joining us on Under the Skin. It's been a, a great component and a wonderful education. Thank well, you. for me too. Thank you. Right, cheers. Thanks, mate. That show was sponsored by my new book, Recovery, which is available. What do you mean you've not gone out and bought it while David Harvey was doing that? Go and get it right now. But what about capital? Never mind capitalism. Get to a shop. But do it on Amazon. Buy it on Amazon if you must. Oh, but everything we've learned. I don't care what you've learned. I simply want you to go and get that book, russellbrand.com. Also, if you like this show, subscribe to it, review it with five-star reviews only. Remember how fragile I am. And tell other people that they must subscribe to it too. Thank you. Now go back to your bloody life.